Internet fitness crusader Ian McCarthy sits down with diet and exercise counselor Dave Pulsanella for an informal discussion about the benefits of a strict, old-school bro science or trial and error approach to a bodybuilding diet versus a new school, science-based approach that allows for a greater variety of foods, including those traditionally deemed by bodybuilders to be junk or cheat foods. Dave has behind him 30 years of transforming his own and others' bodies for general fitness as well as the competitive stage. Ian brings his experience overcoming anorexia as well as an in-depth knowledge of current scientific studies relating to many aspects of diet and exercise as it relates to building muscle and losing fat. Each hopes to make a convincing case for his method, Dave using as examples his own success as a national level competitor and the success of his clients, as well as the examples of a string of iconic bodybuilders, including many of the Mr. Olympias of the past. Ian will certainly utilize the examples of natural bodybuilders who have created large and lean bodies using the more relaxed If It Fits Your Macros or IIFYM style of dieting, popular among young men and women today. Almost immediately, they are surprised by how much in agreement they are on this topic. What is your thing with meal frequency? Well, my thing is that many people in this industry, most people, in fact, in this industry, fitness models and self-declared gurus, right. uh, believe that it's necessary that people eat every two to three hours, or they'll say five to six meals a day, or you'll hear people say things like, you know, I eat 10 meals a day to stoke the metabolic furnace. Right. This is a, a hugely overused cliche. Right. The problem is that they're just not correct. Because we're talking about two things here. We're talking about basal me metabolic rate and we're talking about the thermic effect of food. Right. Neither of which is affected by how often you eat. Those are dictated by how, how much you mm -hmm. eat. Um, and if you agree with that, well, then that's then, then we're on the exactly the same right. um starting point. I agree with you to a great degree. It's not necessary. Yeah. And that the, the necessity of it, I think, um, depends upon what you're trying to do. Eating every two to three hours, to me, impedes people's ability to function. Now, you were a competitive bodybuilder, and that's completely different. You have to admit Competitive that. Yeah. bodybuilders do, it's all about the bodybuilding. And a lot the of what I'm talking about is, is in reference to doing that. Oh, yeah. Which you have not done. You've not taken your body there. Yeah. But it doesn't matter to someone like you who's not trying to do that. Well, no. And I fully respect and understand that. Because uh, there is a certain set of knowledge I don't, that I don't, you can't have unless you've pushed your body into that realm. I think. How do we know that every bit of science that we have today is explaining every single thing that's out there? I is that. it possible that there's something you can do that hasn't been proven by the science yet, but that fucking works? Of course. But I haven't said otherwise. That's bro science. It soon became clear that the discussion was straying from the topic in a way that Ian hadn't expected. I don't know what it was we were really talking about. I was there thinking that the discussion was does meal frequency affect metabolism in this way? Not what do we do with uh, reports of subjective experience that are difficult to explain or things like this. When you say that you, you think that it maybe gives you 20 calories a day additionally, I mean, that's, I'll admit that would be hard to determine, but my question yeah. to you would be, do you have empirical evidence for this? And the fact that and, and the fact that you can't here's say my, that you here's do. my here's my bottom here's my bottom line. Yes. And I think this is gonna be the bottom line for a lot of people. I really do. Yeah. So to me, you don't have to call it speeding up your metabolism, but whatever it's doing, by the end of twenty weeks, it made me more shredded than it would have if I did every four or every three. So I do it. You can give your anecdote, and again, I don't think you're lying. I believe you, I find it hard I find it I Trust find me, I'm crazy. I find the actual claim hard to believe. Yeah. But the problem is you have that anecdote and there are other people that have this anecdote right. of they used to eat six meals a day and they hated it and had no social life and couldn't function and just felt like shit all the time and now they just do two meals a day. Their results are exactly the same. Right. Right. Clearly this one discussion wasn't going to end the debate anytime soon, though there was much more consensus than I expected. But as always, I was more interested in the motivations of these two antagonists rather than the nuts and bolts of bodybuilding diets. I think Dave must have been reading my mind when he asked Ian a question he did not expect to hear, and it took him a moment to dig deep and come up with an answer. Can I ask you why you feel so passionately about that? 
Why about, do you care so much about them? About Just them? Curious. Yeah. Uh, where did that come from? You talk a lot about oh. wanting to save these people from themselves, but why? There is some kind of moral responsibility, I think, as for myself as a maker of videos to ensure that uh, the, the recommendations or advice or the statements I make are true or if there's a certain gray area, which there is of course, that it, it's at least well researched. I've come to my opinion not just on a whim. It, it gives me something to do. <laughs> No, uh, I, I forget who it was. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm terrible with names, but there was a Catholic philosopher, I believe, who said, you don't have the right to die until you've done something for humanity. Now, I'm not trying to overstate what I'm doing here. Uh, tr trust me, it's not dealing with world hunger or vaccine for AIDS, but I, I do feel like th there need to be more people willing to just stand for truth not based on making tons of money or talking about how awesome they are and lots of things with their name all over it. It was no surprise to me that once the distance and anonymity of the internet was removed, the exchange between these two men was far more civil than it had been online. Even though a complete consensus wasn't reached, I think that both Dave and Ian came away from this discussion with a better understanding and respect for each other score a victory for good old face-to-face -face communication. To be honest with you, I was really impressed with him. Yeah. I wasn't going to say that to his face, but... Yeah. I think that we found that we're not so... such different creatures after all. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that we actually disagree a lot less than I expected, which is slightly refreshing and also means that, that we didn't get to argue as much as I expected. But yes. I have to admit that you have convinced me that there is scientific cool. evidence proving that you cannot speed up your metabolism sure. by eating more frequently. I believe you and you have converted me to believing that. However, I'm not going to stop doing it. I don't think it's better in terms of metabolism. I think it's better in terms of being able to function as a human. I agree. He does actually seem to have reasoned reasons at least. It's a bit of a tautology, but he, there's some justification behind what he does, which is actually not bad. It's a good point that these foods are roughly pure in their different macronutrients. However, in the months following the debate, Ian confessed to me a disillusionment with the negativity and shallowness of much of online conversation, and was even thinking of taking a break from the internet, at least so far as retiring his crusader persona for a while. It's just bodybuilding, not saving the world. The, the, the degree of the argumentation we have over this is pathetic, frankly. And I'm saying this about myself too, trust me. Because there was a time when someone would post a link on the NBB Facebook page saying, go argue with this per person about uh, gluten-free waffles. And I would do it. And now they do that and I look at them and I say, what the fuck are you doing with your life? Go get laid or go outside or something. Go make some music or just, why are you on your computer arguing about gluten-free waffles? It's completely baffling. Dave, too, had a few revelations because of the debate, which he originally agreed to do largely because he feared becoming outdated and feared losing his relevance in the fitness industry. I thought for a second, fuck, have I let myself get out of touch? Because that was my biggest fear. I don't want to get out of touch with what's out there. If there's something that's better, or easier and just as good. I want to know about it. It did cause me to take a step back and, consider, and reconsider, because I'm very open-minded when it comes to this shit. Even though I've been doing it a long time and I know what works, it doesn't mean that there's something else out there that might not work too. Bodybuilders are amazing at figuring out what works, regardless of the science. I think you can get very, very, very caught up in the science and very, very limited in terms of what you're willing to do and how out of the lines you're willing to go in your prep. If you get too caught up in that and it's limiting and it will keep you at a certain place and once you want to bust out of that, you'll find yourself doing things like tightening up those spaces between your meals. <laughs> Where Ian is right now is an amazing starting point for him. 
if he actually wanted to bodybuild, which I don't think he does, but if he actually wanted to bodybuild, he could take that knowledge and he could compose excellent training protocols for himself and really good diets that are based on, on science that would work for him. Um, and push the envelope and really get himself into great shape using and not making many mistakes along the way because he knows the science behind it, you know. So, in a way, in a big way, I, I really applaud what he's doing. What struck me personally after editing the video and the one idea I couldn't get out of my head was the notion of a moral duty. As a filmmaker, did I have a responsibility to only present facts that I knew to be true? even if it was someone else saying them. If, for instance, I were to create a documentary about a racist, do I personally have to take responsibility for the terrible things my subject says? Or in some way, am I exempt from that moral duty by taking the stance that I am merely a presenter of real life? More specifically, was I responsible to fact check the scientific accuracy of the six foods that work before posting the clip? even though raising the bar was, in effect, a portrait of a person and not an instructional video. To my great relief, my next project would address that very concept and give me an opportunity to redeem myself in the bodybuilding world. In the final chapter of Raising the Bar 4, we talk about the making of the YouTube video series A Day in the Life of Kai Green and what led to his leaving muscle meds. Victor Martinez is incarcerated when returning from a triumphant win at the Arnold Classic in Spain, then has his arm broken by an overzealous fan, yet still manages to compete at the New York Pro. We check in with Haley McNeff to see how she's doing after retiring from competitive bodybuilding, how she has dealt with the aftermath of her painful breakup, and we learn about her ambitious plans for the future. We explore the reasons Dave will never step on the bodybuilding stage again, see what he's up to now, witness the beginning of a new chapter in his life, and I try to make sense of all of this and tie it up in a bow.